There's a Newsweek article that talks about kind of a remarkable lady. Her name is Jill Price, and uh, she has not had, uh, you know, as far as her life, she, she grew up pretty much like everybody else, except uh, her, uh, when she was about 11 years old, she began to realize that she was different than most people. And that is because that she was not able to forget any event pretty much that happened in her life, whether it was good, bad, important, or even the unimportant things. You know, most of us can remember the really big or, or traumatic things. Those are in our minds. But the mundane things like, uh, can you remember uh, your, every time you went to the doctor in the last five years or those kind of things? Uh, well, she can. She cannot forget those, those type of things. And uh, she has been diagnosed uh, recently with what is known, there's a couple different names for it, but uh, highly superior autobiographical memory, H-S-A-M. And apparently, uh, she, you know, now in school, she was just pretty much an average person because she was not able to remember like some of the things like lists, names, uh, certain things like that. But what she cannot forget is events that happened in her life. And she can go back, uh, especially to the like, time she was 11 years old, remember every birthday, what she was doing, and everything about that. And uh, some things that she would want to forget, she's not able to turn it off and, and not forget it. So Jill Price is able to remember every single event that happened in her life, even the things that when she was two or three years old, she can remember a lot of those. But from the time she was 11, she could remember everything. When she was about uh, around the age of 11, she, she, she didn't know at the time that she was any different than anyone else. She, she began to realize how different she was when she tried to explain to her friends. And they had a hard time understanding about her uh, HSAM, her memory that was remarkable. And so every little detail of her life, uh, she's able to remember. Well, you know, there's God. God is able, of course, he, he has more than a highly superior memory. Uh, God is, is just amazing that uh, he's able to remember us. I remember, I, I love that scripture that says that God remembered Noah. And God is kind of like a, you know, a mother in some ways. You know, a mother, you know, Sandy can't remember. Uh, sometimes she gets the words to amazing grace. But she can remember how much her babies weighed when they were born and how long they were and all that and things that I have long forgotten. Uh, that's just an amazing. Well, God is like that. And so as we look at this passage in Psalm 13, we realize that the psalmist is asking a series of questions, a series of laments that begin with really, how long? And the psalmist here, David, feels like God has forgotten him. Have you ever been there? Have there ever been a time in your life where you maybe feel like you've been forgotten? Where God is, you know, where are you, God, right now when I need you? And so, as we look in this, and we'll probably look at a few verses today, if you want to follow along, uh, in Psalm 13, he begins really with, there's about four times he asks that question. How long, O Lord? You can find this throughout the Psalms, that we feel like sometimes that we don't know uh, when this time, this distance from God is going to end. And he asks the question, how long will you forget me? Now, sometimes in the Bible, we must understand that the writers are writing exactly what they're feeling, and it may not be a reality, but that's what they feel at the time. And so we have to uh, kind of uh, understand that they are writing what they're feeling at the time. And he says, how long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? God is distant 
How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? And so this individual is going through a very tough and depressing time. And some of you have been there. Maybe some of you are there now. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And so the writer of this psalm feels like that God is distant from them. And I've seen people feel that way before. That our prayers just don't seem to be answered. That God seems to be uh, uh, turning his ear away from us. It's almost like we are a, a jilted lover, you know, and we call the person on the phone or we text them and say, why are you ignoring me? How long are you going to refuse to talk to me? And why are you ignoring the pain that I'm going through? And I remember Mary and Martha when they fall at the feet of Jesus and both of them say, Lord, if only you'd been here. Where were you all that time when I called for you and the one that you loved was suffering and dying? How long, O oh Lord? And so the psalmist believes, at least at this point in his life, that God is distant from him. And sometimes it does feel that way. And he even gives a reason, some reasons why God should hear his prayer because uh, he's throwing out some things. Uh, I, I'm going to sleep the sleep of death. My enemies will say that they have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. And your reputation is on the line. And I'm asking you, God, to intervene on my behalf. And so we understand that in this passage here, that at least the psalmist believes that God has forsaken them or that God has forgotten them. I recently, uh, I've been reading a book that's uh, it's a challenging uh, read because it's it's kind of a sad book, but it's also it's a true story. Uh, it's called Unbroken, and it's a story about Louis Zamperini, who was a uh, an airman in the World War II. And during the the war, his plane went down into the Pacific, and he spent with a few other people who di um, several of them died. Uh, uh, like one of the, the longest at that time anyone had ever spent in the, in the Pacific, like 40 some days. And they were fighting sharks and starvation and thirst. And what a terrible ordeal. And if that wasn't enough, when they finally thought they were being rescued, it was an enemy bom bomber, the Japanese, who came down upon them and captured them. And he spent about four years in as a POW from the Japanese army. And the torture and the anguish and the pain that they went through, that he endured, was really hard to imagine. Lewis was a, uh, quite a, an individual before he went to war. In his teenage years, he got into a lot of trouble, was kind of a rambunctious, mischievous boy. But then he took all that energy and put it into running track. And he became so focused and so good that he actually went to the Olympics. And he held the record for the miler for many years. He was quite an individual. But here in this prisoner, as a prisoner of war, he was beaten every day by a soldier in the Japanese army, an officer, for no reason other than he just picked him to, just picked on him. And he talked about how that in times like these, it's if, you, if you can hold on to your dignity, a little bit of hope and dignity, that you can survive. But when you lose that, it's hard for anyone. When you lose your emotional hope, and dignity that's hard to survive. And as I listened to that story and I thought about it, and I'm not going to tell you how it ends, and some of you may already know, but I thought about how I would do in a situation like that. And I don't know. It would be, 
it would be much easier sometimes just to say, Lord, take me on home. But to be able to hold on to hope through those things. And then I think about my life and the troubles that I may have are puny, tiny, insignificant compared to someone like this. Sometimes we have a tendency to make our trials seem mountainous and forget that others around us are going through things much, much worse. And if we don't think it can get worse, it really can. And so I can imagine this psalmist and trying to put myself in his shoes and to understand a little bit where he's coming from and to ask that question and to look up into heaven and say, God, how long is this going to happen? How long am I have to go through this pain? How long must I feel like that, Lord, you've forgotten me? Well, there are some things today that God cannot forget. And there are some things that he can forget, even though he's omnipotent. There are some things he can forget. I'm going to talk a little bit just in a few minutes about, first of all, what God cannot forget. And then what he can forget. God may forget some things if by choice, but there's one thing that he cannot forget. He cannot forget you. He cannot forget me. It may feel like it sometimes. And I don't always have an answer why God allows us to go through these things, these times of trials. But I want you to know that God cannot forget you and I. Uh, in the book of Psalm 103, verse 11 and 12, the writer there says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. And so God cannot forget you, but he can forget your sins. In Isaiah 43, verse 25, he says, I am he. Who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Accuse me. Let us go to trial. And set forth your case so that you may be proved right. God says, I cannot forget you. But I can forget your sins. Aren't you glad today that God is able to put those things behind us and he is able to forget those things about us that are not right? That we can go to God and say, Lord, I've sinned. I've messed up and, and I want you to forgive me. And, and I know there's time, people in our life that may not forget that God says he does. John says that if we... Uh, Confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and all unrighteousness. And God says, I'm going to throw it in the sea of forgetfulness and remember it no more. God actually will not remember that. We walk around with shame sometimes because we feel like we can never forget and we can never forgive ourselves. But God's not like that. God's not going to bring up your sins from your past. If you have come to him and you've asked him to forgive you, he will never bring that up again. That's a wonderful, wonderful promise. And God says that he's got, not going to remember your sins anymore. And then in the book of James, the writer says this in verse, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And so we understand there that the that the trials we go through produce something in us 
that even the mistakes we make, that God can turn those around and make us stronger and better if we allow Him to do that. And there are some good things that come out of the trials in life that we face. And so the psalmist says, I feel like God has forgotten me. I want you to know that God cannot forget you. Uh, in that uh, passage that talks about uh, God forgetting, I want you to look at Isaiah 49, chapter uh, 49, verse 14. Look what he says there. But Zion saith, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. And then he asks a rhetorical question. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? And the idea there is it's a, it's a question that has a resounding no, of course not. Now, any normal mother, there may be some deranged people out there that might forget their children. But I'm going to tell you, I know most mothers that I know would never forget their children. Now, dads, not so much always. Bruce still remembers the time when uh, he was a little tiny thing and there was snow on the ground. And apparently uh, his mom had left and I thought she took him with him, but apparently uh, it was told to me that, that she didn't. But he was playing in his room and I didn't realize it. And so I go to the church, the parsonage, from the parsonage. And I find out later that he was out in the yard in his boots and underwear screaming, My daddy left me! My daddy left me! And, and she was close enough to hear it. Well, I don't know. Most dads probably aren't as bad as I am with that. But mamas, they don't do that kind of thing usually. And so the question is, is a rhetorical question. It's sort of like asking, is the Pope Catholic? You know, yes. Is, is a mother able to forget their child and, and to neglect their child? And the resounding answer is no. And God's love is much, much, much greater than even that. And he says, even though they may forget, I will not forget you. And then he says something very astounding to me. Now, if you ever wonder about tattoos, I'm not a great big fan of tattoos. But if you ever wonder what God thinks about tattoos, did you know that God has a tattoo? It's right here in Isaiah 49, 16. He says, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. You see, in those days, it wasn't unusual for the slaves or whatever, they would put the names of their masters or whatever would be tattooed on their hands. Or the master would do that. And the idea here is God is saying, I have basically tattooed you on the palm of my hand. This is the anthropomorphism, which, which is, you know, sh kind of a comparison to how much God loves us. And God is saying, I have tattooed your name on my hand. I'm not going to forget you. Every time I look at my hand, you're there. I will never forget you. I will never forget you. I love you so much that you don't have to ever worry about that. But I will forget your sins. I will remember them no more and I'll cast them away. I wish some things I could forget. There's some things in my past that I wish I could forget. And pain maybe that I cause other people. Yeah, I wish I could forget those. And sometimes those memories haunt me and they may haunt you as well. And you may have a great memory and, and those things may come up to you as a way of, of like a ghost haunting you in the middle of the night. But I want you to know that God loves you so much that he has tattooed your, his, your name on his hand. 
And he said, I'll never forget you. I love you so much that I died for you. And the scars of the nails are in his hands also to prove it. He can't forget you. But he can forget your sins. And so today, whatever it is, whatever it is you're going through today, every one of us are in a different place in a different time. And I like to think that we're a church that we're not here to judge anyone. That's God's job. We're here to love you and to support you. And maybe, maybe we've strayed. I love that song. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The path of sin, too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. You know what God wants you to do today? He just wants you to reach out your hands and say, like a baby to a mother, I'm sorry. I did something bad. What mother or what father would say to their child, I'm not going to love you anymore. If we came, if our children come to us with their arms stretched out, tears coming down their face, saying, I'm sorry, how many of us would turn them away? None of us. God won't do it either. I don't care what you've done. God will never turn us away. I'm going to ask you musicians to come this morning. And we're going to give you an opportunity. You can pray right where you are. You don't have to come up front, but the altar is open if you'd like to come. But I'm going to ask you today, if maybe you just want to kind of turn things around in your life and you want God to forgive you of your sins, just be willing to do that today. While we sing this song, be willing to pray to the Lord. I want to ask you to pray with me right now. God, I want to pray for everyone here today. Lord, I don't know what anyone is feeling right now or what anyone even believes. All I know is, God, that your love is everlasting and it's unimaginable. And I want to pray, Father, for everyone today. God, that we can put the past in the past, that today is a new day, and that we can start today walking toward the peace of Christ and the light of Christ. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. God, we've been disobedient. We've turned our face from you. And yet, God, you still love us. Lord, help us to live a better life than what we have. And we know that you forgive us when we fall. In Jesus' name, amen.